And forgiveness doesn't mean that uh, the other person acknowledges they've done wrong or even if they say sorry or even if they don't change. It, that's not forgiveness what it's for. Forgiveness is more for you than it is for them. It is freeing ourselves from the bondage of bitterness and unforgiveness and what they did to us. It's, it's leaving it to the hand of God and the mercy of God and moving on from it. Welcome to the Hacker Podcast. My name is Greg Hackathorn. I hope you all are doing well. Well, the last few weeks have been exciting with the launch of the podcast and all the great feedback I have received, but also they have been very slow being cooped up at home. My wife and I are currently in the process of building a new home, and in the meantime, my mother-in-law has been gracious enough to allow us to live with her. I don't think she was expecting to be locked down with two kids under the age of five for over three weeks. So since she is trapped at home with me, I thought this would be a great time to get her on the podcast. Gina Gretsch is the National Women's Ministries Director of the UPCA and Assistant Pastor of the Pentecostals of Sydney. She has a Master's in Christian Counseling and has written a book, which we will talk about at length today. So without further delay, Let's get to the conversation. Well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, as most of you would know, uh, Gina Gretsch is my mother-in-law. Uh, some people call it mother-in-love. I call it mother-in-law. But uh, for my first few years in Australia, I was known as simply Gina Gretsch's son-in-law. So that, uh, and in some places in the world, I'm still known only as Gina Gretsch's son-in-law. So such is the shadow that you cast. I wanted to start out by uh, talking a bit about your background, uh, growing up as an Assyrian in Sydney. So you were born in Baghdad, correct? That's correct. Then My you... parents and I moved to Australia when I was two years old. Wow. So, I mean, you've pr- pretty much been born and raised in Australia, but, I mean, the community that you grew up in, along with your mother as well, were Assyrian. Yes. We settled in a southwest suburb of Sydney, um, where there were a lot of other Assyrian families. Our community was very tight-knit in those days, but we assimilated into Australia very well. My parents both got a job and my brother and I went to local schools here. Um, My mother cooked Assyrian food. She still cooks the same three or four dishes. Yes. Uh, But once in a while, the treat of the week was KFC or, as it was known back then, Kentucky Fried Chicken. My brother loved it. And we would go camping once a year with a few other families. But I always felt safe and secure in in our community. Hmm. So that's out in uh, Fairfield Way? Yes. Weatherwell Park, that area that's right. of Sydney. Those who are Sydney siders, uh, yeah. that would make sense to you. So you grew up in Sydney. How did you come to God? Because um, obviously I know a bit more about you, but uh, how did you come to God? So there was a, one of the ministers in the church in Belmore, as it was known in those days, was a Syrian. And he felt a call to his people. So he started an outreach on a Friday night uh, in a Syrian my mother was invited to go and uh, to one of these outreach meetings and because I was young, um, I had to go with her. Um, the services were in Assyrian and the minister suggested that he take myself and two of my girlfriends who actually, whose parents also had come into uh, the outreach to take us to Sunday school on a Sunday morning where it was in English uh, at Belmore so we could connect better. So how old were you around this time? Probably 12 or 13. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we started attending, and in those days, Sunday school was before the main service. So you had Old school Pentecost. Right, yeah. 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 And it was during one of those services that I felt God deal with my heart, and I realized that I was a sinner, and I needed to be born again. And the rest, as they say, is history. And although the location has changed of our church, I still attend the same church. Wow. So the same church that you first came to all right. those years ago when you were 12. Now, the outreach in the Fairfield area, is that continuing or what happened there? Well, that actually became a church. The man who, the minister who 
um, started the outreach, eventually it became a church, um, not affiliated with UPC, but it is a oneness church. That's amazing. Uh, I don't think anyone would even know that story that goes to the POS nowadays. Yeah. So you you came to the Lord, you started attending Sunday school. Obviously, you probably would have been part of the youth group mm-hmm. um, at which was, I guess, Grace Tabernacle That's right. Christian Center back then. Yep. The OGs, GTCC. Yep. Right? <laughs> um, and uh, so you, you started growing up in the church. When did you first feel the call to ministry? And m- more specifically, not just service ministry, um, because that, the, you know the, the general body would do that, but I'm talking more specifically as like a call to preach or a call to minister. Right. Uh, well, my mother instilled in me at a young age to have a servant's heart. That's how she lived her life, and that's how she taught me to live. So I became involved in different areas of the church where I felt I could serve. I don't know if I can pinpoint the one experience I can say God called me into the ministry, but the more I served God in different areas, the more I felt God leading me, calling me, and equipping me for what he had before me. I remember when I started to feel the Lord leading me to teach or preach, I would get all these sorts of sermons and would write them down, but I had, hadn't preached a single time yet. And a friend of mine, Marcella, and I uh, used to pray together in the mornings two or three times a week. She lived around the corner at that time. And I remember expressing my frustration to her. I have all these sermons, but nowhere to preach them. Mm. So we prayed together that if that was the Lord's direction, he would open the doors. And he did. Wow. So, so... It was more of like a gradual calling. Right. It wasn't like a specific time. Right. Because yeah. oh, yeah. I've heard a lot of people, yeah, it is more of a, a gradual sort of stepping into, you start off as being a servant and then yes. over time, God calls you to something deeper, a deeper type of ministry. Right. And then others, they have that, you know, road to Damascus type right. experience or like, you know, God says, you have to go preach and right. you're called to that. So, so f- how many years are we talking about here? How many years were you getting messages from God and and you really didn't have much of an outlet for it. Mm, it was probably at least a couple of years, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah, at least a couple of years that I was, you know, preparing and, and doing and praying that, you know, if this was God's direction because, you know, we're talking a long time ago where women meet preachers weren't that... Uh, um, Accepted. Yes, and not a lot of them. So, you know, what I felt... God was calling me to do was beyond just teaching and preaching. It was setting a precedent for uh, for women in ministry. And I know you have a passion for that, uh, women in ministry in particular. So I did want to give you a bit of an opportunity to talk about that specifically. I know it's a bit cliche having a uh, woman who is a minister on a podcast and then having her talk about women in ministry. <laughs> Um, But I think it's very important, you know, uh, many times uh, when people are talking about ministers, they tend to uh, generalize and and generally talk about young men or men. Um, But obviously, you know, women can minister. Women uh, do have a call to preach. They have a call that goes beyond teaching a Bible study, teaching Sunday school, but to actually minister to the general body. And you have a passion for this. So um, if... If there is a young lady out there, it doesn't have to be a young lady. You weren't so young. I'm, I'm talking no. about teenage or yeah. early 20s. You were a bit older, even into your 30s, right? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. So let's say someone like that is feeling the call to minister, to preach the gospel. Um, do you have any advice for them? Well, I would, um, I would if, if they felt a calling to uh, that sort of ministry that they make reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God a priority, spending more time in His presence um, and submitting yourself to your leadership, uh, whether they um, see the calling on your life or not as yet, God does. And if it's a God thing, then, you know, it's being patient but serving in the meantime, preparing in the meantime. And that's what I've said to other women or younger women that have uh, ask me about that is prepare don't just wait for you know someone to come along and say hey I feel a calling 
on your life, you know, go for your license or here's an opportunity to preach. You know, God equips us and we have to prepare ourselves for what God is, is leading us to. And it's, it's becoming uh, secure in who you are in Christ because there are people that um, don't agree with uh, women preachers, uh, things like that. So it's a matter of knowing who you are in Christ and knowing that God has called you. You know, I've, uh, when I first started preaching, there was one man who, if I preached, he would get up and walk out of oh, the wow. church. Um, but Brother Slack, who was my pastor at that time, was the one who who recognized the calling of my life and, and uh, put me forward for license. And eventually uh, the man accepted uh, me ministering, and that was more so because of... Um, the depth and the the faithfulness that he saw uh, in my walk with God that yeah. he was able to uh, receive. And that had to come through humility on my part and an acceptance that not everybody is going to be for me. And that's really the same whether you're a male or female. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah not everyone's just going to think that, that you should be a preacher. Right. You know? Because some people, you know, uh, the example that comes to mind straight away is how that Jesus wasn't even accepted in his own hometown. Right. So they saw him, they pigeonholed him where he was at. Right. So that's such great advice. You know, continue to be humble, continue to serve where you're at. Right. And ultimately, if God's called you, it's going to come to pass. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. You mentioned briefly that uh, it was uh, Brother Slack, or I call him Bishop Slack. Yes. Um I'm a lot younger. Yeah. <laughs> and so to me, he's always been the bishop. Uh, bishop Slack, uh, you were his assistant. You served as his assistant for mm-hmm. a number of years. I remember when I first came to the POS, I came end of 2008, very end of 2008 and into 2009. He was still the, the pastor right. of the Pentecostal of Sydney. And I remember a couple of times actually going to staff meetings while I was an intern at the POS uh, at his house. Yes. Um, so I, unfortunately, I didn't have... A, a deep relationship with him, you know, uh, uh, he knew me, I knew him. Right. Um, but I would like the listeners to know more about this great man of God because he was a great man of God. He did in- incredible things in the kingdom of God. Yes. And I think it's important that we know more about this man. Right. Well, Brother Slack or Bishop Slack, as some, of, some would call him, he was the prince of a man. Um, working so closely with him meant I got to see him outside of church settings and Brother Slack was a real deal. He was a true Christian. He was a prayerful man. He was an honest man, sometimes brutally honest. <laughs> but he loved God and he loved people. He was always genuinely happy. There were times that things got him down, but he always looked at the positive in people, always had, was a positive person. He was faithful to God right to the end, to his family and his church. But he had terrible jokes. <laughs> and even to this day, when someone tells a bad joke, they'll comment that it was that, you know, they refer back to Brother Slack and his bad jokes. But Brother Slack was uh, a, a man who believed in empowering others. And he's always said that our church was a teaching church. And we've continued that. Pastor Harvey has continued that, that we are a teaching church. Um, but he was a great man, a great legacy that he has left and instilled in many of us that uh, in ministry today. Hmm. It's a privilege being able to sit under the leaders that he developed, and and looking at the leaders um, in the Pentecostals of Sydney, you know yourself, Pastor um, Brother Ben Finn, and then leaders that have gone out to start churches like Brother Jacob Catabiano and all that. You can see uh, the depth of our brother slack and, and what he did and how he uh helped train right. and, and nurture these right. men and women of god so let's move in a little bit of a different direction um you're the national women's ministry president of the upca right now when did that when did that happen when that was when in you, 2004 2004 mm-hmm. you became the national women's ministry yeah. president and when did you become the 
assistant pastor of the Pentecostal Sydney. So you, 2004 was when, and was that around the same time that you got your minister's license? Yes, yes. Wow, okay. And then you became assistant pastor? In 2007. 2007. Mm-hmm. So within a three-year window, you went from not licensed, or maybe four-year window, you went from not licensed to now leader of the National Ladies and also the assistant pastor of the Pentecostal right. Sydney. Right. What was that like having such a shift? I mean, because you were, you started off this podcast talking about how when you felt the call to ministry, you were praying with Sister Marcella and you're trying to discern where God wanted you to go and, and how right. you were going to have these doors open to minister. And then all of a sudden the doors are open. Right. And, but the shift was scary. <laughs> oh, I, can I remember when I got the phone call from Brother Downs about ladies ministries and being uh, becoming being voted or elected as director and we had landline phones in those <laughs> days and I answered the phone in my bedroom and when he told me the news I was actually was standing up and when he told me the news I, I dropped from the standing position onto my bed I was just so overwhelmed I felt overwhelmed I um, I had been helping Sister Downs with National Women's, Women's Ministries for a while but um, yeah, it, it felt overwhelming and becoming assistant pastor was also a major shift in my life. But I believe God was preparing me for that, both spiritually and emotionally, for quite a while before it occurred. So it didn't seem, um, it seem, seemed a natural progression, I guess, but I still felt overwhelmed and, and the great responsibility that came with that. But it's a, it's a testament to the fact that you were able to you know, not get frustrated when things weren't necessarily happening. God's giving you these messages for a reason. Right. Can you remember back to those times? Did you preach some of those messages? Once yeah, you... I did. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. I so used cool. to keep a pad and pen next to my bedside because it seemed God would always speak to me late at night or early morning. But yeah. That's awesome. Well, that brings us to something that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to highlight. Um, you wrote this book. It's called Fruitful in the Land of My Affliction. And you wrote that around the time that I first came to Australia. I think it was published in 2011. So you would have been writing it the first few years I was here. And um, this book uh, deals with how to be fruitful and victorious even in the midst of trials. And uh, you use the life of Joseph as as, uh, sort of like a lens or a guide for how how to, to go about doing that. Um, And so I just wanted to read some portions uh, of this book and give you the opportunity to, uh, you know, reflect on it, expound on it. Because uh, over the years, so many ladies, you know, it doesn't have to be just ladies. I was blessed by it. People all over the world have been blessed by this book. And I think it would be good just to go through it with with the author, the person who wrote it. And, um, you know, because on the podcast, we like talking about ministry. We like talking about church helps. But we also like talking about books. Okay. And uh, so we're going to read a few passages here and allow you to reflect on it. Okay. All right. So I wanted to start here with uh, the introduction, uh, page one. I awoke one morning early in 2010 when suddenly I was overcome with heaviness. Had I been dreaming or was this the reality of my life? All too quickly, I realized that, yes, this was my reality. Oh, How I wished it were a dream, actually, even a nightmare, but it wasn't. I turned over onto my side as tears started to roll down my cheeks. What's the deal, God? I wasn't angry, just hurting. I felt his presence in my room. I closed my eyes, and I saw myself preaching at my church. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Remember that? Oh, yes. My faith to believe what I preached was now being tested. What a way to start a book. I mean, as a preacher of the gospel, it seems like when you preach a sermon, you know, you yourself are challenged as well, Uh, especially when you see yourself struggling with with the thing that you've actually preached. Yes. And it's like, okay, well, I've preached it. Now I've got to live it. Right. So you started the the book in in such a way. Um, Why did you start it that way? I wanted to, um, one, exp- express to the reader, you know, uh, from what point, I, what, where I was coming from, that 
it doesn't matter who you are, that you know, we all experience times of affliction or times of trial. And that was the starting point, I believe, for where I could introduce Joseph mm. and his and his trials. That I wanted this to be a personal thing. It wasn't just, you know, we read about people in the Bible, but then when you know we can put life to it when we experience the same thing that they experienced. And I truly felt that at that point in my life that, you know, um, that this was one of the hardest times of my life that I'd ever experienced. Yeah, and I was there, so I'm well aware of that. Um, this wasn't something that you just put together uh, to try and understand what Joseph was going through, but you right. were going through trials right. similar in nature. So many times we read the story of Joseph or hear it preached, and unfortunately the anguish and affliction that he suffered are just skimmed over. It can seem so matter-of-fact to us. Yes, he was sold to some Ishmaelite traders, and yes, he was wrongly accused and put in prison. But because the story of Joseph has a fairy tale ending, that is what we seem to focus on. But the reality of the story of Joseph is that he did suffer anguish and deep affliction throughout the years that he was separated from his family. Anguish and affliction has not changed over the many years since the time of Joseph. I can relate to him, and I am certain you can too. That stuck out to me because so often we treat stories in the Bible like they're stories. Like right. They're not real people. Right. And this is something that I try to harp on whenever I talk about stories in the Bible or people in the Bible, that these are real people yeah. that went through real experiences. Right. And we see that in the names that Joseph gave his sons. You know, um, speaking about God helped me to forget my my uh, family, my anguish of my family, and um, and we see it. You know, and I explain that in the book later when he uh, comes to uh, when he faces his brothers and they actually are speaking in in Hebrew and he can understand them, but they don't think he can because they think that he is he is uh, Egyptian. And the older, I think it was his oldest brother said to the other ones, didn't we see the anguish in his soul when we, um, when, you know, when he got sold? So, you know, it was deep. Mm. Joseph's pain was deep. And it, it took him a long time from what we read to get through it. And it was real. It was real. Yeah. Like, it's not like th this is a real person going right. through real pain. Yes, he did. Yeah. And I, I love how your book brings that out. Another passage from the book. Something to understand is that if we choose to hold on to our unresolved hurts or betrayals, they become seeds in our life. Mm. These seeds grow and have roots that seem to reach into every corner of our beings. Look after each other so that none of, us, none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many corrupting others. That's the problem. You and I influence others. You may not think you do, but unless you live on an island on your own, you do. Some people are a good influence and others are a bad influence, but everyone affects someone else. When I allow a root of bitterness to grasp a hold in my life, those roots touch all those around me and affect them too. And I was drawn to that because I heard a quote on a podcast recently um, they were talking about mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually a podcast about um, uh, military veterans. Right. And they were talking about mental health and, and some of the things that they carry back with them after they've served overseas. And they said something along the lines that while we were burying it, we didn't realize that what we were burying were seeds. Wow. And many times you see individuals, sometimes we do that ourselves, where uh, instead of looking at it instead of uh, discussing it, trying to work through it, bringing it to God in prayer, we try and bury it. Right. And unfortunately, the thing that we're burying is not just dead and it's going to decompose, but it's actually seeds that are going to bring right. forth some sort of root of bitterness. I thought that was powerful. Yeah. And it it does, it, it will manifest itself at some point in our life. Um, we are We have been commissioned by God to forgive. It's not a it's not a choice, it's a command. And 
unless we do that, you know, whatever hurt it is that we have experienced, then it will eventually bleed out to every other relationship that we have. Yeah, and that influence, that effect will right. be multiplied. Yes. It's not just going to stay with you. Right. But if you allow those seeds to take root, you allow that root of bitterness to grow, then that's just going to become exponential. Yeah, and it continues from generation to generation. Wow. Another thing that stuck out to me from your book, not all things that occur in my life are good. And and you're Mm. referencing um, the famous passage, we know that all things work together for good to them who love God. The preacher's one of the preacher's favorite uh, yeah. scriptures. We all fall back on that one. Um, not all things that occur in my life are good. Life happens whether you are a Christian or not. But because I have submitted my life to the Lord and asked that His will be done in my life, He will orchestrate what does occur in my life for the good of my spiritual being. In Joseph's case, he didn't see the good for many years, mm. but eventually fruitfulness was the result of of his time in the land of his affliction. Right. And um, I just wanted you to expound on that because I have I find that powerful that, you know, you, you hear that passage and you think, tomorrow all things are going to work together for my good right. <laughs> or maybe next week, yeah. uh, maybe next month. We're in a instant uh, gratification. Yeah. You know, we want things straight away. Um, and Joseph waited years and years and yes. years, and sometimes we have to. Right. So, it you know, sometimes we make decisions or choices that may be not right or correct, but God can still use those. God will use, when we submit ourselves to him, he can use anything because he's God and he knows the end from the beginning. He can use it to produce good within our lives. You know, the Bible says tribulation works patience. So no one wants to go in tribulation, but... Mm-hmm. Sometimes we need to develop patience in our life. God can turn our tribulation to good. His motives are always pure towards us, and that really helps us to understand that everything can work together for good. Not everything is good, and it's not always easy, but God can use it to produce that, which in his eyes is beneficial to us. Amen. Because of that relationship that we have with him, we're submitted to him and allowing his perfect work to come out of our lives. Right. Whether we may think it's good or not. Yeah. In the end, it is good. Right. Wow. I've got just a couple more that I want to read. I can never deserve the forgiveness of God, yet he gives it unconditionally time and time Mm. again. I'm so thankful that his mercies are new every morning. When you see the sun rise tomorrow, know that his mercies are new. So make the choice to not allow unforgiveness to be part of your life, but choose to forgive. Forgiveness is not a feeling. To be honest, there have been times when I waited until I felt like forgiving. I wouldn't have. Right. Sorry if that disappoints you, (laughs) but I'm human, and my human nature is enmity against God. I lean towards self. This is especially so when I'm hurt or wounded. Learn to walk by faith, not by sight. Choosing to forgive in the face of being wounded, is walking by faith. Faith in God that he will take care of you. Right. Remember that forgiveness is a choice, a good choice, a choice that has eternal consequences. Right. We always have a choice. Yeah. We always have a choice. Right. And I've had people say to me, I can't forgive. And it's, it's, so, it's still a matter of the will that you can. It's not a feeling. It's a choice, you know, um, a choice that God, if it wasn't possible, God wouldn't expect it of us. But forgiveness is a choice and we are to forgive. When we look at Christ and what he forgives us every day, right, we are able to then turn around and forgive others. And I think what you were, yeah, what you were referencing in that portion of the book was, was this idea that This person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. Why should I forgive them? Right. And forgiveness doesn't mean that uh, the other person acknowledges they've done wrong or even if they say sorry or even if they don't change. That's not forgiveness what it's for. Forgiveness is more for you than it is for them. It is freeing ourselves from the bondage of bitterness and unforgiveness and what they did to us. 
It's, it's leaving it to the hand of God and the mercy of God and moving on from it. And this is coming not just from a biblical perspective, which you know a lot of us would be aware of the, the biblical mandate to forgive, but also from a clinical perspective. I mean, you're, you're not just uh, an assistant pastor and a minister of the gospel, but you're also a Christian counselor. Right. And so from a secular perspective, you know, uh, secular counselors call it releasing hmm. or uh, moving on, right? Uh, which in as a Christian, we know it as forgiveness, oh goodness, but yeah. it's, it's freeing ourselves from what the person did, not allowing it to affect our everyday present life. Hmm. A couple more. This was one that I thought was really good, especially for what we're facing right now. Once I stepped into my land of affliction, my normal life changed completely. My life used to be predictable, and I was comfortable in my zone. Mm. But now, what was normal? I had no clue. Not knowing what could possibly occur next stretched me in a few different ways. It meant I wasn't in control, but it also encouraged me to seek God and trust Him. And the reason I pulled that out is because what's been happening over the last year and a half in uh, for those who may not be aware, you know, even now here in Sydney, um, with what they're calling the new normal, with the rolling shutdowns and right. and people's lives being thrown into disarray. I mean, we I mentioned it this morning. Today was the third Sunday in a row that you haven't right. been able to worship at church. Did you ever go three Sundays in a row without no. going to church? If I've never ever done that. If I'm in Sydney, I'm in church, and I I, I think it'd be less than one handful of times that I haven't been well enough to go to church on a Sunday if I've been in Sydney. And it is a, you know, um, it's hard to accept the new normal at this time. And yeah, that, that passage really does speak to us right now when we're on, not in control. And it, it does for people like me who always want to be in control. It, it's hard. You don't know when, it's going to be lifted when we're going to be able to go to church, uh, travel or, you know, all these different things that was part of our comfortable, normal life. So it is a matter of, of hunkering down and trusting God and knowing that he knows he's in control. It's just a matter of letting him be in control. Yeah, and, and that's so important, especially for someone like me as an American Moving over to Australia, I'm like, my freedoms are being infringed, right. you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember last year, it was just like the first month of this thing. Every day I was just like, come on, you yes. know. And, uh, and, and, but you're out of control. I mean, right. we're out of control. We, we, we can't do anything. Yeah. I mean, if we, you know, you have people speaking to, you know, who want the pastors to, you know, break the rules and have right. church. And we should have church anyway. Well, I mean, we'll have a good Sunday. Right, but then the pastor will be in prison, yeah. and uh, the church will be locked up and yes. fined, and 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 all of this. Um, so it's not so simple. It's not so simple. Just uh, you know, disregarding the right. rules, disregarding what's been put in place. But it's about that faith and that trust in God. Yeah, he he knows what he's doing, and we just got to trust in that. Yeah, he wasn't surprised by this. No. Yeah, COVID didn't take right. him. It took all of us by surprise. Yes. And it <laughs> continues to baffle me how uh, some people, some leaders continue to respond to this. And I'm talking to my friends over in Canada, right. um, different portions of America, just the craziness that's been yeah. going on the yeah. last couple of years. But at the end of the day, when we can't do anything about it, we just got to put that faith and that trust right. in him. Yeah. And, and keep walking. Amen. And and see what we can do. Right. Even while we're, quote unquote, locked down. Yeah. I wanted to finish off the last portion I'll read. Um, and this is a this is a great book. Um, like I said, it has blessed people all over the world. And I just touched on a few uh, little portions here or there. I didn't even read, what, three or four percent of the book. So I encourage you guys, if uh, if you do want to read the whole book, uh, you can get it. It's on the, the POS website, POS Sydney. You can get it there. I'll put a link in the show notes where you'll be able to find it if you're interested in reading it. But I just wanted to read this uh, as we move on from this portion of uh, the podcast. 
as I finish writing this book, and this you're writing this towards the conclusion, mm-hmm. I'm still in the midst of the land of my affliction, and you may still be in yours. Despite this, we can still be fruitful and victorious. Looking back at the past four years, I can see how God has changed me. Mm-hmm. My trust in Him has deepened. I don't panic. Well, not as much <laughs> as I used to when I cannot control what is going on in my life and around me in my world. And we just touched on that, didn't we? Yes. My compassion towards others has grown. I do not judge others as I used to. Mm-hmm. I have learned to obey the Word of God more and heed His voice with fewer struggles. And finally, my love for my Savior has deepened. Mm. This causes me to weep even as I am writing this down. I know I am not perfect and have a long way to go, but I also recognize that I have traveled forward a long way. Now, you wrote that 10 years ago now. It's been 10 years since this was published. Um, And since that time, uh, we touched on it a bit, but you've attained your master's in Christian counseling. Mm Mm-hmm. You've traveled throughout the world ministering when you could travel. And I guess last year you traveled a bit via Zoom. (laughs) You zoomed into other countries. Um, You've seen your ministry continue to grow. Um, Your family has grown and the POS has grown. Um, We've grown by hundreds, doubling. Um, How have you continued to be fruitful in your walk with God over these last 10 years? Well, I guess part of it is that, you know, uh, even though that trial that I actually spoke about a lot in the in the book, uh, I've come through that. There have been other trials, other uh, deep trials, you know, um, wilderness experiences, things like that. I, I guess I've continued to make prayer a priority and reading of the Word of God priority and serving a priority in my life that I want to keep growing. And I think that's really important in each one of our lives that we don't get to a place where we're comfortable, where we feel that we've attained, that we can't be taught anything or I'm always open to learn and and grow from others' ministry, from what we hear on a Sunday every week, that... I, I I know that I'm still got areas where God needs to work on me, and I'm thankful that uh, He's still working, mm-hmm. and can still be fruitful in the matter. Right, what we're going through. Yeah, and and that's what's so great about that book is that um, it challenges you to to not take uh, the easy road. You know, when right. you're going through trials, and and obviously the trial itself is not the easy road. What I'm meaning is. You're going through the trial and you use that as an excuse. Yeah. As an excuse to not be fruitful, as an excuse to um, sort of just fold your tent up and go home, you know? Right. And uh, no, it, it, it's such an impactful book and uh, I encourage anyone um, to read it, not just because it's my mother-in-law's book, but I believe it's a very encouraging and, and helpful book. Well, in conclusion, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to share a word. I know you've been um, touching on things throughout this conversation, but obviously the conversation has been guided by me, (laughs) and I've sort of directed you in the way I'd like you to to address certain things. But this is an open opportunity for you to just share a word with the listeners to encourage them, uh, whatever God has laid on your heart for the podcast. Well, I thought about it and, you know, I asked, felt from the Lord just to um, share the scripture from Psalm 42, verse 1, which is one that I I love that talks, it says, as a deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after you. And I think as a Christian, um, never to lose the, the uh, pursuing of God and his presence and our love for him, and that'll help us to continue to be fruitful and to maintain our walk with him when we don't lose that. You know, if you think of a deer when it's when it's looking for water, it pants after it. It's got to get to it. And if we pursue God like that, that 
I've got to find you, God, whether it's, you know, for answer prayer or just to feel his presence. I know there are times that, you know, we don't always feel God's presence and we don't walk by, by feeling, but, you know, I, I, I crave that presence of God and, and when there are times when I don't feel it that I, I come into my prayer room, it's like, God, I, I need to feel you. I need to know that you were there and to speak to me and to uh, reassure me of your presence and your love. And, and that's that panting after God, that as a Christian, that we never lose that. Regardless if you've walked with God for one year, 10 years, 20 years, that, you know, sadly we see that sometimes as people grow older and walk with God for a long time, that they seem to lose that passion for his presence and and it's more of a lifestyle than a than a relationship so i guess my encouragement would be to pursue after god and his his word pursue after him and his presence there's nothing nothing in this world that can satisfy like the presence of god i don't know about you but i enjoyed that conversation in the wisdom that she shared in how to grow in your ministry and navigate times of affliction. If this blessed you, please share it with a friend and encourage them to follow the podcast. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and a number of other platforms. Just search the Hacker Podcast and you should find us. We have a number of other conversations in the works, and I can't wait to share them with you. I appreciate all the feedback and those who have taken the time to rate and review the show. It has been a blessing to me. Thank you again for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you next time on the Hacker Podcast.